Our next two presenters are Mary Lynn Bergstrom and Joan Starr. Mary Lynn is a UC San Diego Liaison Library for Research Data Curation, Science and Engineering. As a member of the Research Data Curation Services Program, she manages EZID services, registering campus re researchers for accounts through which they can assign identifiers, DOIs and ARCs, to their research data. She also provides training on the concepts of research data management for liaison librarians. With other RDC program members, she participates in refining and teaching a series of workshops on the concepts of research data management for campus user communities. Her recent previous responsibilities include head of the UC San Diego Science and Engineering Library, head of UC San Diego Biomedical Library Education and Outreach Services, and director of library services for a multi-campus health care system, UMass Memorial. She received her MLS from the Graduate School of Librarianship, University of Denver, and a BA in Russian Language and Literature from studies at Boston University and Bard College. Joan Starr works for California Digital Library, part of the University of California's Office of the President. There, she is the service manager for EZID, a data management service that makes it easy to create and manage unique long-term links to scholarly objects. In addition, Joan chairs the Metadata Working Group of Datasite, an international organization working for easier access and increased acceptance of research data in scholarly communications. And she is active in Force 11, a community of scholars, librarians, archivists, publishers, and research funders working to help change scholarly communication through the effective use of information technology. So welcome. So uh, I guess I want to start by thanking the organizers for today's symposium. It's a real pleasure to be here and to be presenting with my friend and colleague, Mary Lynn. So uh, as as Deb mentioned, we're here from the University of California, and we really do have collaboration in our bones. When you go to the home page of the University of California Libraries, and you find your way over to the About section, you will run on to this statement, and you'll see that even when we talk about collection policies, I mean, something as dry as collection policies, we highlight multi-campus collaborations. I mean, that's how serious we are. There are 10 campuses plus the Office of the President where I work, and that means all of our committees have 10 members, <laughs> at least, right? And so, you know, we have, we just do this all the time. And so I like to say it's baked in to what we do. We think about it uh, and we do it. We work uh, with each other on conference calls quite a lot. And uh, we at the California Digital Library, on behalf of the campuses, we participate in lots of other national and international collaborations to represent the campuses. So, um, so that's why uh, I really was excited when Mary Lynn said, hey, let's see if we can present on this idea of collaboration uh, here at this conference. Uh, so in that vein, and I'm going to carry on this baking metaphor, the recipe for the talk today, I'm going to touch on Easy ID, which Deb mentioned I'm the service manager for. Then Mary Lynn will introduce uh, her work at, uh, at San Diego, the research cyber infrastructure. And then we'll wind things up with uh, a few lessons learned. All right, so, oh, golly, wow. All right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. So, uh, a lighter touch. This is Easy ID, a little quick look at it. Um, my home page is over there on the right. Uh, basically, we're about uh, providing uh, a way to create and manage long term identifiers. Right now, we offer DOIs and ARCs, two different kinds of identifiers. Um, and the, the point of this uh, is to make it easy for researchers to do some of the things we've been talking about today, share and cite their work. Identifiers gives you a way to, you know, you, you 
you register a target URL and some metadata. And then if, if that data moves, which we, our last speaker just talked about moving data, right? You, uh, you update that target URL and any links that have been shared, any citations and so on, will still work. You avoid that horrible broken link situation. The metadata that's associated with DOIs now in Datacite, thanks to Datacite, is being indexed by several really important indexers. Uh, and so, uh, you know, th that's how this system works. Here's how it looks in action. This is, a, this is a snapshot of a page from Dryad, a data repository in the environmental sciences. When they take a data set that's associated with a publication in that field, they just go right along and say, here's how we want you to cite these data packages. So, uh, so there's no guesswork. And so if we go then to the, uh, the Springer page where that paper uh, is, you know, shown in the, re in, the, in the reference list, here's the Dryad data package. And there's the DOI that came from EasyID because Dryad happens to be an EasyID client. Okay? There's the basic idea. So um, what I do uh, as the service manager, I mean, I, I do quite a lot of things, but one of the things I do is I prepare quite a lot of campus outreach materials for folks like Mary Lynn. <laughs> one of those things is, is uh, outreach postcards. I've got a stack of them over here on the table, and if you're interested, you can pick up one. I have a science version which is this one right here. And recently I put together a digital humanities version because this year the NEH and the IMLS started mandating uh, data management plans for the humanists. You know, everybody's getting in on the game. But those humanities folks don't like to talk about data. They don't use that word. They call it something else. So I had to go, uh, I had to, actually I was here in Chicago during the polar vortex attending the MLA to listen to how they talk about this sort of stuff. And I, so I've translated this all into digital humanity speak. So anyway, um, I may, you know, so I have this material up here and then I have created a version that can be edited. And so you can see right there, Mary Lynn has made one for her campus, right? So she can print them out. Now, the other thing I do for campus folks is I run uh, webinars all the time, every year. I have uh, conference calls, I'll, I'll provide training, any kind of hand-holding uh, that any of my clients need, I'm there. And so with that, I'm gonna turn things over actually to Mary Lynn to sort of take it from here and show you what happens on her end of things. Another microphone working here. Can everyone hear all right? And I have to echo Joan's thanks to the conference organizers for giving us this opportunity. Um, and I have to echo and begin describing appreciations to Joan for all the work she does to make EasyID such a service. So in addition to the outreach support in terms of tools that she's already mentioned, um, and the webinars and training that she gives to, to members, uh, those have all proven successful on my campus. And I was when I was given the assignment as the liaison librarian to manage the Easy ID service for campus researchers, I thought, oh, this is going so slowly. That's just this dribs and drabs, and they contact me. And Joan then points out, oh, well, you have more than most campuses do by a fair number. So now I feel much better about the numbers of labs that we have signed up over the past couple of years that we've been doing this. So you can see it's a range. Um, it's not exactly apparent, but um, Nye does bees, so we have bee communication, we have the neurosciences, we have a couple that I'll talk about more later. We have the signaling gateway is about protein cellular signaling metabolisms. Um, we have California Coastal Atlas, and then we have 
um, Ocean Leadership, which is an international consortium of 102 agencies uh, across the world that's counting, I don't know, every grain of sand there is. Mm -hmm. And we have um, the Gilson Lab is in the pharmaceutical sciences. So there's been really diffuse and broad uptake of this. And that's um, created an opportunity for me to go out and do site visits. In most cases, I say, hey, can I come and visit your lab and you can show me what you do? And they love to talk about what they do and I love to listen to what they do. And it gives us a lot of information as we develop the program um, to, to find out what services are of interest and then to see how they use EasyID. So we think of it as a high-tech, high-touch assignment. I'm the, I'm the human element that goes out and makes myself available, and I can promote services that are very effectively supported. Um, usually, I, t I take my laptop, I fill out the little minute application form and email it to Joan, who is on it. I think you did one today, didn't you? Uh, no. You responded to an yeah. inquiry today. <laughs> and she will, from wherever on the globe she is, get back and say, they're in. And then, so I'm there, and their faces light up. It's, <laughs> So funny because it's it's just a form, right? <laughs> but they get a kick out of it. Um, so that's that's part of my role is being that person. So as I've had that assignment on behalf of the libraries for a couple of almost three years now, um, and the library pays for that subscription, so we're able to say the library supports this service to support your research. At the same time, um, the Research Cyber Infrastructure Initiative was taking, taking shape on campus. And here's the sort of background on that. Back in um, 2008, a set of collaborative partners on campus got together and said, what can we do to ensure that UC San Diego retains its competitive edge as a research institution that's it's able to describe and present proposals and secure funding and secure faculty and students who are cutting edge people and be the kind of environment that we want to be going forward. So some of the partners were the Supercomputer Center, Administrative Computing and Telecommunications, the Office of Research Affairs, the library was a key player right from the get-go, which is um, something I'm really proud of. And the uh, Cal IT2, which is down at the bottom there, is a, a University of California initiative. Um, and that particular one, we love our acronyms, as I'm sure all of you do, um, stands for California Institute for Telecommunications and Information Technology, so IT times two. Got it. Um, so we had a variety of players, and what do a variety of academic players do when they get together? They form a needs assessment. So a, a needs assessment was conducted, and the basic questions were, what do campus users need today? What do you think you're going to need tomorrow? And what is hindering your research? So how to kind of tease out some responses to that. And the basic answers, I'm not sure how clearly you can read this, but the, the main one, the main driver was long-term storage, data backup and long-term storage. But then, um, no, sorry, short-term storage was bigger than that. Sorry, data backup, short-term storage was the largest one. Um, but the long-term preservation and, and storage was, was a, a large chunk, 64%. Um, and then 55% were talking about metadata creation. So that was sort of the call of the librarians. We were like, we hear you. We're ready. Um, not quite sure what it was they thought they were talking about, but we could translate that into in the report that was developed as a result of that survey, it's called The Blueprint for the Digital University. We have a link to it at the end of our slide deck, which you'll have available to you, but you can also just Google Blueprint Digital University and you'll get that. Um, it was sort of interpreted into a, a network, centralized disk storage, co-location, condo clusters, and there's the digital curation piece, the curation services that the library said we're on it.
So there was a call, the Oversight Committee for RCI, the Research Cyber Infrastructure, was finally funded. The Chancellor wrote the check, and um, there was a call for pilot proposals. We wanted five proposals. We got many from across campus, and the selection process was to try and sort of match what I've gotten in a very organic way in terms of easy idea counts, um, to, to match the discipline distribution across campus, and to provide a variety of different kinds of challenges in terms of curating data. So five different pilots were selected, and I'm going to just say a little bit of detail because we don't really have time to talk about the whole project, but um, talk about the ones that uh, had uptake on the Easy ID aspect of it, and talk about what we learned from that. Oh, you weren't kidding about yeah. this. <laughs> <laughs> OK. OpenTopo Open is an NSF-funded uh, portal. They collect um, photographic LIDAR imagery and have done so for quite a while, so it's a large um, data set. They also have software and analytic tools associated with the, with the photographs, with the images. They should, no, photographs. Um, they didn't want data storage, but they did want an interface. So they wanted, so the, the library's proposal for data curation was to provide an interface that was through our digital asset management system that the library already supported. And um, they wanted, so they basically wanted a landing page that would take people to their already established large scale data storage. So this one was more about um, access and less about the storage itself. But they were the first client for the DOI service. They understood that. They had some interesting conversations about what constitutes an object and at what point do you assign a DOI versus an ARC, et cetera. They've been, I think, relatively active on the listserv. There's a listserv that comes along with membership. And um, they've, they've been really actively assigning them since almost the very first day they signed in. So that's Open Topo. Next up was the Levantine Archaeology Laboratory. Um, Tom Levy, this is uh, his, that's him down there in the mirror. Um, and those pots are his pots. They, well, they're not his pots, they're the world's pots. Um, they do archaeological investigations of societies in the southern Levant from the Neolithic to the Islamic periods. And that's um, the, his, his labs, his archaeology site is in Jordan. And so we have a lot of sort of seasonal access because it's not easy to maintain ongoing communication with um, Jordan, but. They, their lab is creating tools to unify their field work and the objects in cold storage and the digital imagery that they obtain from the site. They have these cool, um, they don't use drones, they use balloons. And because you don't want to disturb stuff, you don't want to set up any kind of turbulence that would disturb the site. So you send, you guide these balloons very slowly with cameras, bunches of cameras. And, and then you have imagery. So it's, it's, a, it's a very neat data set. And they're working on a metadata profile for these cultural objects. And they have now signed up the, for DOI service. Um, and in this case, Tom Levy didn't want to be the, the PI, didn't want to be the one who signed up for it. He had, of course, one of his key graduate students do the, do the legwork. I think earlier today, somebody was saying, who, where's, where's the learning curve and how do faculty um, take up this, this new kind of processes and this new information they have to learn about managing data? And I think in many cases, they kind of shovel it off to a, oh, there's Aaron. He looks young. He'll know about this. So. And the third one that I'll just mention is the Laboratory for Computational Astrophysics. Um, astrophysics was big in the news just in March. There was a whole new discovery about that little nanosecond right after the Big Bang and how it proved that the universe was doing whatever it was doing, unfolding or unfolding, I forget. But at any rate, this, um, this data set that we were asked to, to handle as part of this pilot was about that little nanosecond in time. It's, it's simulation data. And simulation data is vast. 
and there's no images or anything associated with it. It's just a mathematical simulation and the results thereof. So it's a bunch of software code that you have to store, and then there's a bunch of simulation results. But that is just a made up thing. <laughs> that isn't part of their data set. Um, so they're publishing simulations about astrophysical phenomenon, star formation, and turbulence. But for the purposes of this pilot, it was this one particular, it's called the Santa Fe light cone uh, redshift. And if you Google it, you'll get to a bunch of data. And one of the interesting things about this, in, additional, in addition to their use of the DOIs, was they had intense metadata needs. And we, at the time, in our project, had an intense metadata person who spent like a year Someone was talking about wishing they, Viv, you were saying you wished you could spend time with a scientist. He just about moved in with this guy into his lab. I mean, he would come to meetings and tell us about what he was learning about astrophysics. It was really amazing. But the metadata needs were, were huge. Um, one of our lessons learned is that we don't have enough metadata people to assign in that way. But, um, but there was, so there was a learning curve about what we can and can't do and what's scalable. Um, and they also stored some of their data, and I think it's still there, in the California Online Archive, which is a UC collaboration that um, the California Digital Library has created. So, lessons learned. We've learned a lot. So, let's just zip through these, um, because of course you already know all these things anyway. Um, uh, so the first one, um, shared purpose. We think that uh, good collaboration uh, results when you, uh, the members of a collaboration share a purpose. And I think in this one, uh, uh, both of us really want the researchers here to succeed. We, uh, we both have that common aim. And communication. Say it often enough, and you, you can't communicate in enough different ways between all the members of any given collaboration. So Joan and I are in close touch frequently in a variety of ways. The voice is a good way to maintain communication, email, Twittering, whatever. Um, and in maintaining communication, whatever the effective modality is with your user groups that you're trying to tie together to reach that shared purpose. Right. Free Frequent and, and multimodal. Uh, so, um, so I think uh, working with e with each uh, member of a collaboration's uh, greatest strengths uh, is is important. I mean, all of us have uh, strengths and weaknesses, right? And so, find uh, you know if if your strength is costuming, uh, <laughs> go with that. Um, I mean, you know, we're being silly here, but I mean, the point is work, you know, try to figure out what each of you is especially good at and, and emphasize that. I mean, maybe that's simplistic, but I think you, you may take my point here. And don't undersell yourself in terms of um, what your strengths might be or what you're capable of learning or being effective at. When I was initially asked to be involved in the research data curation, I was like, I'm not an IT person. They're like, you don't have to be an IT person. You have to be comfortable talking with faculty. Well, that's something I'm really actually fairly good at. So if you, it just depends on how you frame it and how you see yourself and how you're willing to see yourself moving into the future. So I will. So capacity, capacity, that's a very important lesson to learn and to consider. During this, the course of the slides that I was showing about UC San Diego's work, um, the library itself reorganized. And so I was heavily involved in a reorganization of the library. And I think my capacity for doing anything interesting with marketing Easy ID was, was pretty minimal. And fortunately, there wasn't a lot of pressure. No, no quotas are established. It's just sort of you, you do what you can as you can do it. But, but be realistic and don't beat yourself up about it. And our university librarian, when we were first engaged in this, came down to a meeting, and he never comes to meetings, so when he does, you're like on the edge of your chair. And he said, our goal is to have five happy researchers with their data under curation by the end of this project. And we're like, five happy researchers? That was such a nice image, and it was such a nice, like, minimal capacity 
I only described three, but we really do have five, and they're all happy, so we did it. <laughs> so minimal goals are really good, little toes in the water. Uh, staying current, I think that's actually related to the communication goal, because uh, good communication, you can stay current on what's going on um, with each other. Stay current with each other, stay current with your user community, and keep learning, keep going to opportunities to learn anywhere you can. Is that the end? That is the oh, end. We are. Here's a couple, few quick links. Um, the top one is another colleague of ours at UCLA who actually did get embedded with a research group. The middle one is another write-up about collaboration because we love it so much. And the bottom one is the link to that report. Um, and here's how to get us. And, and I will share these slides, uh, and I'll tweet it using the hashtag for, that we have today. So. Questions? Yes. I have one about the whole way in which you've implemented the easy IDs. And it, sorry. Sounds like. Um, you're working with particular research groups, and presumably they're keeping their data however they keep their data. You're not talking about just using this as something when they put it into something that lives in the library. So how have you all thought about the persistence of these supposedly persistent IDs when to some extent you don't have control over these research projects? And what if 10 years down the road, what happens to them? Is the library committed to, for instance, you know, helping with updating links if they do some mass you know, move or change about where and how their data lives? Or do you have any agreements, or do you just kind of hand them over? For the data that came in through the, through the research cyber infrastructure, and for data that we anticipate coming in in the future, we do have policies about, about persistence. For those people that I go out and I sit and I listen and sign them up for an account, I talk to them about it, but I have not gone back and said, show me what's in your desk drawer. I want to see if you have any random thumb drives with data on them. Uh, so there is no, um, there's no campus policy. Um, so I was asking you guys if you had one. We don't have one either. And there's no um, requirement from Easy ID that. Actually, there is. There's, and there's an ethical <laughs> assurance that, yeah. that there is, but there's no yeah. like prove it on a no. monthly basis or quarterly update. Are there's there an any, expectation. Do you, any, do you run anything to check links availability? In Not it? yet. OK. Uh, is it my own? Yeah. Uh, we don't have link checking going right now. We probably will be developing that. Mm -hmm. uh, but link checking is a little different from, we do have a policy, yeah. um, and all, all clients sign it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Any final That's questions? true for all data site members. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, well, thank you very much.